Hi, I'm Christy Schreiber, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is our second week discussing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the letter that some consider today to be one of the most significant political documents to emerge from the American continent in the last 300 years. It ranks right up there with the founding documents and the Gettysburg Address and the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, last week, we spoke a little, although very briefly, about Dr. King's growing up years. We uh, focused on his rise to political prominence through his political activism in Montgomery with the uh, Montgomery Improvement Association and Rosa Parks as they led a community to boycott public busing for 381 days. And they protested the unfair busing practices in Montgomery. These efforts resulted in legislation that would begin the process of unraveling a hundred years of Jim Crow laws across not just Birmingham, but the entire South. We also discussed Project C. C, by the way, stands for Confrontation. Project C was the name they gave to the program that was designed to combine economic pressure with large-scale direct action protests in order to undermine the very rigid system of segregation that was in place in Birmingham, Alabama, among other places, but specifically Birmingham, Alabama. The project was multifaceted, and by that I mean there were a lot of moving parts. It consisted of strategic sit-ins, mass meetings, economic boycotts, and of course what we know so well, the quote parading without a permit because nobody would give anyone a permit. (laughs) (laughs) True. And you know, one significant component of this project was planned for Good Friday, April 12th, 1963. Uh, And it would be on this auspicious day that two political and spiritual leaders, Reverend Ralph Abernathy and Dr. Martin Luther King, would step out in faith in front of the 6th Avenue Zion Hill Church to march down those prohibited streets. Um, And leading by example, proving that they would never ask anyone to do something they would not do themselves, they walked into what they knew would be a guaranteed confrontation with Bull Connors, tightly controlled police force. And as they marched, uh, they were met by a police barricade. So they changed directions and marched a different way. However, it wasn't long until they got to a second barricade. At this one, Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor's clear orders could be heard. And I quote, stop them. Don't let them go any further. They were arrested, and let me add, this was not the first time these two were arrested, and it certainly would not be the last. So uh, Dr. King and Ralph Abernathy, um, according to Abernathy's own words, were closer than blood brothers. And there is a deep trust between these two men. And if you remember, they had been leaning on each other since those early days in Montgomery, Alabama, where Abernathy was pastor of Montgomery's First Baptist Church. And the support would continue even after Dr. King's assassination where Abernathy would follow through with the support of the Memphis sanitation workers. Uh, That was the strike that had brought Dr. King to Memphis on the day that he was murdered. And Abernathy and King eventually would be jailed together a total of 17 times, and both they and their families would be the targets of multiple assassination attempts. Well, it's just incredible. And as we think about these two men leading this march that day on April 12th, it's also important to highlight the many different people, both men and women, who were involved in this campaign that changed the world. One man who would make history in ways he could not have anticipated uh, was Dr. Clarence Jones. Oh, yes, Dr. Jones. Um, Dr. Jones is not a native Southerner. (laughs) His parents were domestic workers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and and although they worked for some of the most affluent people in the United States, the community was an anomaly and really had been integrating voluntarily even during Jones's early years. And Jones attended Catholic boarding school and then became a notable graduate of two prestigious universities, Columbia University and Boston University, where he received his law degree. Dr. King asked him to come to Alabama to be a member of his legal team in 1960. From there, they not only worked together, but also became personal friends. And 
After Dr. King was arrested on Good Friday, Jones, as his lawyer, was permitted to see him on that next day. Well, what's interesting to me uh, is that uh, Dr. Jones and that initial meeting. Now, here Dr. King is in solitary confinement, uh, and he gets there. And he's, uh, but when he gets there to talk to Dr. King, getting Dr. King out of jail was not the most urgent crisis on Jones's mind. They had an even bigger problem than Dr. King being in solitary confinement. Very controversially, and we'll talk about this again next episode, but Dr. King encouraged children to join the movement. And there had been many children who had followed Dr. King that day as he marched. Most of them were from lower income families. And now those children were behind bars and their parents were outside yelling at Dr. Jones, demanding that somehow he get money to bail their kids out of jail. In later interviews, Jones would say that the parents of those kids were out there outside the jail, literally asking him, what are you doing to get our kids out? So when Jones went to visit King, this was his concern. He wanted a list of names. He wanted telephone numbers of people to call. How were they going to get this bail problem figured out? So he was talking about that, but Dr. King had something else on his mind. When Jones entered the cell, King said, have you seen this? And he was livid. He showed him the full page ad that had been taken out in the Birmingham Herald calling him an outsider, lecturing him, demanding that he be patient. Jones remembers, and he talks about this in many interviews uh, all throughout his life, that Dr. King pulled out his copy of the newspaper where he had seen this letter, and he looked, and there was scribbled writing all over it. On every piece of blank space on that newspaper, Dr. King had written between the ads and in the margins, and he had picked up scrap papers all over the jail cell, paper towels, napkins, toilet paper, anything he could write on, and King gave all these scraps of paper to Jones. Jones smuggled them out of his pockets in his under his shirt anywhere these pieces of paper uh, yes and over the next five days twice a day Jones would bring more paper to Dr. King uh, King would write and Jones would smuggle them out under his shirt and remember this is before 9-11 when everyone was patted down so he would take the scraps of paper to Wyatt Teal Walker King's chief of staff and a woman by the name of Willie Pearl Mackey it was given the task to put it all together. So what about the children? What did King and Jones decide to do to get them out? It's actually an interesting part of the story and would likely be more famous if it hadn't been overshadowed by the letter itself. But Jones was able to raise money to get those children out of jail. And the famous actor uh, Harry Belafonte got involved. And he called Nelson Rockefeller's speechwriter, a man by the name of Hugh Morrow, who was a supporter when he found out about what was happening in Birmingham. That Saturday, Jones flew to New York City. And even though it was a Saturday, he met Morrow and Rockefeller at Chase Manhattan Bank and walked out with $100,000, which was enough bail money to bail out every one of those children. Well, I guess if your name is Rockefeller, the bank opens when you want it to. <laughs> wow. Well, Jones uh, wasn't the only one who had no idea that day how important that letter would ultimately become. Neither Mackey nor Walker uh, understood as they stumbled through that very challenging task of trying to put together these pieces of handwritten paper. Uh, apparently, Dr. King's handwriting, like most of us in the best of circumstances, isn't that easy to read. Uh, but he'd been writing furiously in the dark, relying on his encyclopedic memory of Shakespeare and the Bible and uh, Augustine and Voltaire and the many other philosophers and theologians he quoted throughout the letter. Some of these were on newspapers, others were on plain paper, paper towels, all these different scraps, and they literally had to be pieced together. Mackie, who claimed all of her life that she wasn't a, quote, fantastic typist, typed it up and prepared this manuscript that would ultimately go out for public circulation. If you look at the original version, which today resides in the library at Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama, you will see that the typed copy concludes with the initials MLK colon 
WM, noting the letter's author as well as this very important woman who typed it. The amazing Willie Pearl Mackey, her personal story is interesting and amazing in its own right. She was committed and had been fighting segregation herself from the, her early days living in Atlanta. Uh, one example I'll just give you real quick. At one point, she quit her job at a hospital in protest because the hospital refused to treat an African-American gentleman who had suffered a heart attack because it was a whites-only hospital. I bring that up to point out that every person involved is had a conviction and a commitment to what their part would ultimately be. You know, and again, I think highlighting all the people who contributed, like Jones and Mackey and Walker, is very important to understand. When events happen in history, the perception is often that they were accidental or caused by the stars or something, but that is never the case. And in this case, thousands of children and men and women, uh, you know, they took great personal risks and they did it honorably for a long time before things changed. So as we get into the letter, uh, last episode, we finished by reading the first three paragraphs. I did want to point out that the version I read, uh, which is the one most commonly found in textbooks today, has been abridged from the original not necessarily to revise the content, but just to make it more manageable for students. And uh, today we will read from the original um, as preserved in the papers of Dr. George Bagley. Dr. Bagley, uh, as a white pastor, was the executive secretary of the Alabama Baptist Convention and a likely recipient of this original version. Um, Although it's not totally certain how he received this copy, This original version is 21 pages long as typed by Mrs. Mackey. It was uh, released originally to the media in May following King's arrest on that Good Friday in April. It wasn't officially published until June in the large-scale publication Christian Century, which is a magazine out of Chicago. All right, so without further ado, let's jump back into the letter. If you're a student, I encourage you to pause the podcast for just a second and number the paragraph so you can follow along and reference the exact text as we quote from it. There are 50 paragraphs in this unabridged version, and we will reference the specific quotes by paragraph. Last episode, we read paragraphs one through three. And I hope you can remember and recognize the anger, the sarcasm that was embedded in the language. We'll start by reading those three paragraphs and then also adding paragraph four. My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all of the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would be engaged in little else in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill, and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms." I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South, one being the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Whenever necessary and possible, we share staff educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on hand to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. I readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promises. I am here along with several members of my staff because we were invited here. I am here because I have basic organizational ties here. Beyond this, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I, too, am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, 
I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere in this country. Well, of course, uh, Dr. King cannot possibly view these men as being of, quote, genuine goodwill. Or if they were, they were some of the most misinformed or willingly blind ministers in the great state of Alabama. But either way, as professed religious leaders in their communities bold enough to take a public stand against racial integration, they were about to get a lesson in history as well as Judeo-Christian theology, starting with Dr. King assuming the role of apostle, subtly or not so subtly really, comparing himself to the greatest of all Christian apostles, the apostle Paul, who penned the majority of the New Testament, which is the sacred text of all Christian faiths. In the introduction of his response, he compares his response to Birmingham to the apostle Paul's famous response to the call to help in the Bible from the people of Macedonia. In this famous biblical text, the Apostle Paul had a vision from God. And in this God-given vision, he receives the commission from God. And I'll quote Acts 16, 9 here. The Bible says, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Oh, well, this wouldn't be the last allusion to the Bible uh, that Dr. King would make, but, you know, it informs the reader that Dr. King's authority will not be coming just for himself, but his arguments would be founded upon the words and the principles of the uh, sacred text that they shared in common with the letter writers. True, and another great strategy Dr. King uses is not only does he use words and principles from the Holy Bible— Dr. King very successfully and very quickly, starting here at the beginning of the letter, uses the minister's own hypocritical words against them. These men are quick to demand that Dr. King and his followers live by a set of rules that they themselves very conveniently do not apply to themselves. This practice will be called out over and over and over again. Indeed, and starting in the very next paragraph, um, he quotes these ministers before challenging their words, and they've accused him of meddling in the affairs of others and uh, somewhere where he was not invited to come, which is ironic considering that, uh, you know, most Christian denominations see evangelism or proselytizing really as part of their mandate. And he confronts the hypocrisy of calling him an outsider directly. He boldly states that, um, you know, whatever happens in Birmingham affects everyone. And he famously puts down this most recognizable line, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that uh, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And he, and he says anyone living inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. Well, the outsider accusation, that's pretty easy to knock out. And he defends it fairly quickly and decidedly here in the first four paragraphs. And he's ready to move on to their second complaint. The one claiming that he's the one in Birmingham stirring things up. Let's read paragraphs five through eight. You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham. But I'm sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being. I'm sure that each of you would want to go beyond the superficial social analyst who looks merely at effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. I would not hesitate to say that it is unfortunate that so-called demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham at this time, but I would say in more emphatic terms that it is even more unfortunate that the white power structure of this city left the Negro community with no other alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. 
collection of the facts to determine whether injustices are alive, negotiations, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that racial injustice engulfed this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than any city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers. But the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiating sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as the promise to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a moratorium on any type of demonstrations. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs remained. Like so many experiences of the past, we were confronted with blasted hopes and a dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. So we had no alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. We were not unmindful of the difficulties involved, so we decided to go through a process of self-purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and repeatedly asked ourselves the questions, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? We decided to set our direct action program around the Easter season, realizing that with the exception of Christmas, this was the largest shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this was the best time to bring pressure on the merchants for the needed changes. Then it occurred to us that the March election was ahead, and so we speedily decided to postpone action until after Election Day. When we discovered that Mr. Connor was in the runoff, we decided again to postpone action so that the demonstrations could not be used to cloud the issues. At this time, we agreed to begin our nonviolent witness the day after the runoff. This reveals that we did not move irresponsibly into direct action. We, too, wanted to see Mr. Connor defeated, so we went through postponement after postponement to aid in this community need. After this, we felt that direct action could be delayed no longer. So he confronts the power structures here directly, and he highlights the intentionality um, of what is being done in the face of the ongoing violence. And uh, well before he arrived, there was a long history of injustice and the turning of the blind eye by the city fathers. And I I love that he uses that term to refer to the men running the city. Uh, It highlights the role that they should have played in protecting their citizens. And, you know, a good father would never turn a blind eye to his child being abused. And uh, the inference here is that negligence occurring on a broad scale in the city is really no different than, you know, the deadbeat dad who abandons his children and allows other men to hurt them. Yes, and he also is ready to open the movement's playbook and describe the thinking and the process behind what these men just casually belittle. He again quotes the letter from the ministers. and their letter, they ask for negotiation, to which he responds, that's the point. The purpose of direct action is negotiation. He again explains the paradox that the only way to have negotiation is to create a tension so great that the power structures are ready to negotiate. Otherwise, they just ignore the complaint. Well, here he compares the tension that they are creating in Birmingham to the positive tensions of the mind, you know, referenced by Socrates. There's another historical reference. And when we pick up the reading again in paragraph 11 through paragraph 14, uh, Dr. King describes the purpose of direct action campaigns, as well as he paints a picture of the degrading experiences of the Jim Crow laws that were being experienced by millions of African-American citizens of the South. So, Christy, read those paragraphs for us. 
All right, I'll skip down to paragraph 11. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved South been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in my monologue rather than dialogue. One of the basic points in your statement is that the action that I and my associates have taken in Birmingham is untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this query is that the new Birmingham administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before it will act. We are sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Albert Boutwell as mayor will bring the millennium to Birmingham. While Mr. Boutwell is a much more gentle person than Mr. Connor, they're both segregationists dedicated to maintenance of the status quo. I have hope that Mr. Batwell will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to desegregation, but he will not see this without pressure from devotees of civil rights, my friends. I must say to you that we have not made a single gain civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. Lamentably, it is a historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture, but as Reinhold Neighbor has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was, quote, well-timed in the view of those who had not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the e ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we stiff creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait, but when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse kids and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness to white people when you have to concoct an answer for a white year old son who is asking daddy why do white people treat colored people so mean when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you when you're humiliated day in and day night by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes the N-word and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John and your wife and mother are never given the respectable title of Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you know forever fighting a de degrading sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, that you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience.
Wow. So much is packed into those paragraphs right there. But I don't want to miss the the sarcasm at the very beginning. <laughs> so, you know, he starts by comparing the election of Mayor Albert Boutwell to the return of Jesus Christ. And I mean, it totally highlights the ridiculousness of those who have hope that a segregationist mayor will bring justice to the African-American citizens. Yes, I, I think it's important to break that down for those who might not understand the biblical illusion. Well, so the, the New Testament of the Christian Bible ends with the book of Revelation. And in this book, there's a vivid description of the end of the world. And even if you aren't a Christian, you're likely familiar with a lot of the imagery uh, because it shows up in lots of dystopian movies. I mean, this is where we see things like the famous number 666 or... Uh, the reference to the Antichrist or the mark of the beast. And the book describes a planet Earth that's gone out of control through totalitarian controllers, leveraging every available technology to control human behavior. It's a very dark book. But at the end of it, according to Revelation, Jesus returns to Earth as a ruler. He destroys the totalitarian dominance and he leads humanity to a period of divine peace. What Dr. King sarcastically says here is do you honestly think that Albert Beltwell is Jesus and <laughs> ushering in Christ's reign on earth? The man is a segregationist, exactly like Bull Connor. He's not coming to bring divine peace. I mean, instead, Boutwell is a part of the existing power structure that is reigning in terror. And he then begins to vividly um, describe the realities of the segregated world for African Americans, really highlighting the psychological trauma that it creates, and even more specifically in children. And um, how it builds by its very essence, uh, it's going to build resentment and fear and underconfidence and ultimately rage. It's very hard to read these paragraphs without feeling the anger and the sadness after describing the experience of being denied into whites only locations or, or being made to sleep in a car. He then will juxtapose two kinds of laws and the difference in breaking an unjust law versus enforcing an unjust law. Let's read paragraph 15. These are just a few examples of unjust and just laws. There are some instances when a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I was arrested Friday on charge of parading without a permit. Now, there's nothing wrong with an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but when the ordinance is used to preserve segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, then it becomes unjust. So in paragraph 15, he says, You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break clause. Of course, this is something they were all familiar with. But then in the next paragraphs that follows, and we'll skip these because they do get long, but he goes on to school them on the difference between what a just law is and an unjust law is theologically. Citing St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, and the Lutheran philosopher Paul Tillich. Let me remind you, by the way, that he's citing all these men from memory. He reminds the reader of something all of these men already know. If you are a person who accepts the idea of a higher law given by God to man and that God's law is above man's civil law, then it is also, then we also are sub- subject to the laws of God. When these two things clash, it is not only man's right to stand up to an unjust law, but as a leader and teacher of God's laws, these men specifically have a divine responsibility to not only know the difference between these two things, but to be on the side of the higher law. He says, I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right. And I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances because they are morally wrong. And of course, in case you don't understand a reference, that's the uh, 1954 decision of the Supreme Court that is referring to, then we know it as Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, that's where the federal government determined that segregated schools were illegal. Um, a law which, of course, George Wallace defied with his famous line, segregation forever, 
But I want to go back to his theological argument because uh, this is something every government student needs to be aware of. You know, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, laws uh, really are, must uplift the human condition. And the terms Martin Buber employs are difficult for us to understand, like I-thou relationship versus I-it relationship. But the idea is something most of us feel intuitively. Laws must apply equally to everyone. What applies to me should apply to you. Because under God, we are the same created person worthy of respect. And and if there is a law that applies itself differently to different groups of people for whatever stated reason, that is an unholy or an unjust law. I mean, under this theological premise, every Jim Crow law, by definition, is ungodly and unjust. Well, it's difficult to follow uh, the deductive reasoning because he's tracing and applying thousands of years of theological training and thinking to this very specific modern day situation. But he carefully explains the nuances of the moral complexities through paragraphs 19 through 22. And he is going to give multiple examples, examples that his minister colleagues are already familiar with. Let's read these examples in paragraphs 19 through 22. Sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I have been arrested on a charge of parading without a permit. Now there is nothing wrong in having an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but such an ordinance becomes unjust when it is used to maintain segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and protest. I hope you are able to see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law, as would the rabid segregationists. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice, is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are references to some of the earliest examples in the Jewish and Christian sacred texts, where in the book of Daniel, in the Bible, they were thrown into a fiery furnace for not praying to King Nebuchadnezzar, and for which God himself appeared in the fire with them and kept them from getting burned. Of course, he references the early Christian martyrs, many of which were thrown into that Roman Colosseum. But closer to their present moment, he references that everything Adolf Hitler did was absolutely legal, as were the persecutions that Christians were suffering at that very moment in communist Russia. Now, for those who aren't familiar with what happened, Stalin routinely rounded up Christians in the middle of the night and they were never seen again. He took their children and put them in orphanages. They were raised by the state because they were to have the proper values and views that the government saw fit to give them. We have to keep in mind that for us reading this letter in the 21st century, Stalin's communist regime and Hitler's Nazi regime are a long time ago uh, in a distant part of history. But... When Dr. King was writing, he was referring to things that had happened during the lifetimes of the people who were reading the letters, things that they not only knew about, 
but had participated in. I mean, it was they themselves, you know, their brothers and their fathers, and many of whom had died, who had gone to Europe to fight Hitler. It was their Jewish friends and literal family members who had fled here from across the ocean, who had been victims to the gravest, really, expression of man's inhumanity to man. And that was the legal racism of the Nazi regime. And it was their Christian brothers and sisters uh, with the same exact beliefs that they had who were being thrown into prison and slaughtered under the heavy authoritarianism a Soviet communism, and legally enforced atheism. There is no way any of these Christian or Jewish ministers could defend the idea that they had just proposed, the idea that a Christian should always obey the law because government by its definition is godly and infallible. And there is no way they could defend the idea that according to Judeo-Christian values, treating people differently, claiming that certain laws or rules apply to some but not to others, is a defensible position by Christian and Jewish ethical and moral standards. Uh, And their lives and their actions in other places on earth was proof that they actually knew better. We'll end today by reading and discussing uh, paragraphs 23 through 26. In these paragraphs, King references the use of the sanctimonious term moderate. Of course, King was accused of being a radical extremist. And as such, by definition, if you're an extremist, everything you know is usually wrong. He'll revisit the accusation of being extremist again in paragraph 31, But first, he wants to talk about this term moderate, because the term moderate sounds like something we should all strive for. After all, it's a positive thing if you're a, you know, moderate drinker or a moderate eater. I mean, even a moderate exerciser can be good. And on the other end of the spectrum, of course, in most things, being extreme is not that great. I mean, you don't want to be an extreme drinker or eater or sometimes even extreme exercises too much. But In most political discourse, uh, for example, most of us shy away from being labeled extreme right or extreme left. But Dr. King is going to hone in um, on how these terms, moderate and extreme, are labels that people use for other things. Um, And as such, it is not good to be a moderate if that word is not really being used to mean moderate, but could be replaced really with the word apathetic and Truth be told, uh, by most objective standards, Dr. King very much was a moderate. His methodologies were controversial for that very reason. Um, There were many civil rights activists who were promoting violence and other extreme courses of action, and he will speak to all of that. But this term white moderate, as King explains, was often a cop-out term used to describe actually apathy to the plight of the African-American in the uh, face of obvious and brutal oppression. So let's read paragraphs 23 through 25. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, and who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a, quote, more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exists for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fan in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious negative peace 
in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this a logical assertion? Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't this like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical inquiries participated the act by the misguided populace in which they made him drink hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? We must come to see that as the federal courts have consistently affirmed, it is wrong to urge an individual to cease his efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because the quest may precipitate violence Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. On an aside, for those of us who appreciate beautiful rhetoric for the sake of artful craftsmanship of the words and sentences themselves, there is a lot to appreciate in this entire speech. In fact, if you cross-reference Dr. King's letter with a glossary from the old AP language and composition textbook, you will see that Dr. King uses every single rhetorical device and strategy in our textbooks today. His craftsmanship is diverse and colorful, both with his word choices and his sense and structure. But just here, look how he builds this rhetorical climax to the repetition of the phrase, I had hoped, I had hoped. Notice how he creates beautiful paragraphs by explaining the differences between a positive piece and a negative piece. Notice how he creates a vivid simile comparing segregation to a boil that cannot be healed unless it exposed to light. And even light itself is an archetypal symbol of truth that dates over 6,000 years to the beginning pieces of human discourse. Those are just the examples that I pulled from paragraph 24. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your English nerdiness is coming out. I mean, I like to see you get excited about things like parallelism and similes. I know, but it's brilliant, and I think it's worth pointing out that it's remarkable this piece of writing, not just for what King says, but how he expresses it. It's done with just the most artful and extreme craftsmanship. True. And, and I want to highlight uh, that we see both the craftsmanship of language, but it intersects with the depth of ideas. I mean, that's two very powerful, strong things put together. And, you know, here he compares the idea of negative peace and the idea of positive peace, because we don't think like that. I mean, what the heck is negative peace? Uh, that's an oxymoron, but he will correctly make the argument that all peace isn't the same and peace in and of itself isn't the goal. And in fact, has never been the goal. Uh, what we want is positive peace where everyone is treated with dignity and respect by the authorities for sure, but also by each other. Uh, you know, violence will occur inevitably when there is a transgression of this idea of dignity and respect. It doesn't matter if it's between two people uh, or one group of people against another people, but also by an outside force oppressing everyone. And that is what Bull Connor was enforcing in Birmingham, even among the white population. Bull Connor was so committed to segregation that if a white citizen resisted Jim Crow by taking down the whites only sign on their own private property, he would be cited and fined by the city. So if you're a white person and complied, you wouldn't have a problem, but you also wouldn't have a positive peace. And King does not encourage negative peace. Negative peace may look like peace, uh, but it is when everyone is being subjugated and oppressed and silenced. For King, that is not the goal. And uh, he will also claim that 
when you have negative peace, the power structures can enforce this negative peace for a while, but eventually tension will build below the surface and the violence will emerge. And positive change without violence, well, that's King's ultimate goal. Uh, Yes. And furthermore, he's also going to reference this terrible practice that people in power tend to do, and that is to blame the victim when they do things that violate their own stated rules or principles. These series of rhetorical questions highlight uh, what today we often call gaslighting. Uh, you know, and that's the idea that uh, that a person in power, um, you know, that they they do something to create a no-win scenario for you so that no matter what your reaction is, in the face of obvious unfairness and cruelty, you can be blamed for the result of whatever happens. Everything will always be your fault. And again, he uses example after example of this happening, ultimately landing on the example of Jesus Christ. Because of every Christian knows, Jesus was falsely blamed and ultimately crucified for making statements that were not acceptable to the political structures of his day. He was accused of inciting violence. The authorities claimed it was his fault that he was crucified because his devotion to God basically made people jealous. It was his fault that he made people want to crucify him. It's this twisted way people have of blaming victims for the violence that they themselves are willing to perpetrate. Well, it is. And, and of course, in paragraph 26, um, he quotes a letter he received from a white gentleman in Texas claiming that African-Americans just needed to wait and that change takes time. And King's response to this man is succinct, um, but not really without controversy. I mean, King uh, claims that time does not heal wounds. Time is neutral. It is what we do with the time that will heal or not heal. So let's finish today by reading this paragraph. I had also hoped that the white moderate would reject the myth concerning time in relation to the struggle for freedom. I have just received a letter from a white brother in Texas. He writes, All Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, but it is possible that you are in too great a religious hurry. It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. Such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time, from this strangely rational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ails. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be either used destructively or constructively. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of good will. We will have to repent to this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but by the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy and transform our pending national elegy into a creative psalm of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our national policy from the quicksand of racial injustice to solid rock of human dignity. And of course, uh, the uh, beautiful imagery of describing racial injustice as quicksand and and building a picture of uh, we as people pulling together out of it onto the solid rock of human dignity, of course, that, that draws from the biblical parallels of Jesus Christ as he commands his followers to build their lives on the rock. And, you know, uh, although the exigence of the moment requires Dr. King to rely heavily on the sacred text of Christianity and Judaism, his logical explanations appeal to men and women of all faith traditions as well uh, as those with no faith tradition. You know, next week we'll finish the letter as well as discuss what happened in Birmingham when Dr. King was bailed out by a local millionaire, the African-American businessman A.G. Gaston, for $5,000. 
We'll also revisit the controversial practice Dr. King had of encouraging children to protest alongside their older brothers and sisters. Yes, and we will see that it was this controversial decision to put the lives of children on the line and allow Bull Connor to publicly unleash violence on his little ones that really led to complete outrage and dissembling of the apathetic or uh, modern whites from around the United States and around the globe and even in our enemy at that time, Soviet Russia. So a lot to look at next time. Uh, So as always, thank you for listening to our discussion today on paragraphs 1 through 26 of Dr. King's letter from Birmingham Jail. And Next week, we'll finish the letter. Um, If you enjoyed the discussion, please give us a five-star rating on your podcast app. Also, please reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. You know what they are, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, You can also go to How to Love Lit Podcast and look at our teaching materials. And don't forget on the website, you're going to find all kinds of supports if you're an instructor. So thanks for being with us. Peace out.